On behalf of Private Wealth Advisors, myself, Roger, Jack and Grant, um, and all the attendees that have joined, thank you, Tony, for doing this presentation. We were having a bit of a laugh before. We actually had Tony booked in uh, two years ago, and then um, unfortunately for, for us, he, he skipped off over out, outside of the bank. So for uh, the ex-bankers in PWA, congratulations, great move. Um, I won't do a big introduction because everyone's here specifically to listen to you. Um, so I'll hand it over to you. I guess um, quickly for everybody, uh, there's a question and answer button at the bottom middle, uh, Q&A. Uh, what I'll do is I'll keep an eye on those questions as they come through. Um, Tony will just be speaking for maybe 35, 30 to 35 minutes, uh, maybe 20 minutes for, for questions and answers. But as they become relevant, we'll um, throw them at you uh, as it comes in. So over to you. All right. Look, thanks very much for that, uh, Ben. And uh, yeah, thanks, everybody, for being online. Um, I'm assuming that basically it's my image you are mainly seeing there. Uh, if not, just let Ben uh, know in some format. Um, yeah, OK, so uh, oh, where do we start? Things are starting to become very interesting in the New Zealand economy now. I know a lot of people have focused on the extended lockdown in Auckland and the negative impact on many businesses there, and then anticipation of the opening up, I guess, pretty much from November 29 or, sorry, December 1, is obviously going to lead to a big, bit of a surge in economic activity. But I'm, I'm personally not so much interested in that sort of uh, stuff there. It's an interruption, a bit like we had before. We know what happened um, um, afterwards. I'm a bit more interested in some of the other far bigger picture things which are happening out there, such as the consequences of the Reserve Bank uh, running excessively loose monetary policy for too long. It was appropriate what they did last year, throwing all the uh, the petrol they had uh, on the uh, fire there to avoid some sort of uh, depression scenario, but it was fairly obvious from late last year that things were going quite ballistic in the asset markets, but also the economy was doing relatively well and uh, they should have been removing the uh, sugar from the fire there early this year. Uh, they haven't. Uh, they seem still pretty reluctant to do so. And so uh, for those of you who've been around a while, there are elements uh, appearing now which uh, we are familiar with of excess inflationary pressures excess exuberance in the economy. And if you've seen this before and predominantly ahead of the uh, global financial crisis, back then it took the Reserve Bank over three years to actually get things slowed down in the economy to get the inflation back under control. And I think that this time around, it's also going to take quite a bit of effort on their part uh, in order to slow down growth in household spending. And uh, that's going to catch out a lot of businesses. And having worked in the banking sector there for three decades or so, I have no doubt at all that right now uh, they're dragging out all the great haired uh, people there and uh, asking them to give some seminars on what happens when things go a bit too ballistic, which sectors, which business types, etc., um, are most exposed. And uh, while a lot of people are thinking generically in terms of there's been a boom in household sort of borrowing and lending, uh, we need it to switch across to the more socially responsible lending uh, to the business sector. I, I have a slightly different view, the household lending growth definitely coming down, but not so much of a surge in lending to the business sector, because I think of a lot of sort of profitability and business just basic business management issues that are going to be cropping up. And uh, even in sectors growing strongly with huge activity like construction, I think we're going to see quite a few failures, not from a deficiency of demand, but simply an inability on the part of many people to contain their enthusiasm in accepting orders, inability to manage shortage of materials, shortage of council staff for the inspections, shortages of labor, etc. And these are the sort of things I have been hammering quite a bit in my uh, weekly Tony's View uh, publication there, and will continue to do so uh, going forward. So if you haven't already signed up for that, just go to tonyalexander.nz and just on the first page there, um, there's, uh, you can sign up and go for your life there. Now, if we take ourselves back initially a uh, year and a half ago, COVID-19 comes along. We hadn't seen that sort of thing before of a global pandemic, uh, of lockdowns. None of us really had the foggiest idea what was going to happen. And as humans, when we have a new negative thing uh, come along, we naturally gear towards the most negative scenario, basically. 
And so we saw predictions of house prices falling maybe 10 to 15 uh, percent. I thought maybe 5, 10 percent or so. We saw predictions of the unemployment rate maybe going above 10 percent. I thought maybe 7.5 percent. Uh, predictions of house construction falling away 30 percent or so. I thought maybe uh, 20 percent. And then uh, people saying that maybe the level of activity in the economy gross domestic product won't get back to its pre-COVID levels for three, you know, maybe four years. So it was all looking fairly uh, dire there. But of course, the outcomes have been astoundingly different um, everywhere around the planet, basically. In New Zealand, house prices did fall by 3% when we were in that economic shrinkage period, the lockdown. So that was over the April and May period. Since then, average house prices have risen almost 40%. And so average house prices now are 35% plus above where they were in uh, March of 2020 uh, as we were heading into lockdown, um, et cetera. So a vastly different outcome from what any sane person um, was expecting. The uh, number of consents issued for new dwellings to be built in the year to March 2020 was 37,000. Now we're rocketing along at 47,300 and the underlying pace of growth or level of activity in recent months, it's actually about 51,000 sort of annualized consent numbers for the past few months. So things have gone ballistic uh, there. Uh, the economy did shrink 11%. Uh, in the June quarter last year, could, a lot of stuff couldn't happen. Bounced back 14% in the September quarter. And where we sit uh, for the June quarter, latest uh, GDP data, economic activity was about 4.5% above uh, the December quarter, I think was the comparison I used of 219. So we really quickly uh, exceeded the pre-COVID level of uh, economic activity. And the unemployment rate, yep, it did go up. It went from 4% to 5.2%. And now with the Reserve Bank having uh, vastly overcooked the economy, we've got an equal record low unemployment rate of 3.4%. The last time we had that unemployment rate was uh, 2007, labour market obviously very tight, strong wages growth, all that sort of thing out there. So there's other indicators out there, but yeah, basically they sum up the situation and you'd find similar things uh, overseas as well. Now, why have we seen our economy perform so well? Uh, one factor I've already spoken about, and that's the Reserve Bank basically pulling out all the stops justifiably so at the time, given the pessimism so many of us uh, were expressing. And as I've been reminding people over the past sort of year and a half, it's not just that the Reserve Bank cut the official cash rate three quarters of a percent in March of last year, uh, they had already cut interest rates 0.75% in 2019 between May and August. And they acted in response to the inflation number for, I think it was the December quarter 218, March quarter 219, only 0.1% increase in each of those quarters. And the problem for our central bank and others overseas was worries about deflation, inflation being too low. In fact, in New Zealand between 2013 and 2019, inflation averaged only 1.3% uh, um, per annum. So way towards the bottom of the uh, 1 to 3% uh, uh, range there. So they cut interest rates and we went into the first lockdown with accelerating momentum in the economy and more especially in the housing market in terms of sales, uh, construction, and of course prices as well. Particularly in Auckland, there was a strong 3.5% increase in Auckland average prices in the March quarter of 2020. So the Reserve Bank then went and cut the interest rates um, again. And uh, of course, well, these record low mortgage rates at the same time as the LVR restrictions were removed. It initiated a whole lot of searching for property by uh, first home buyers uh, during lockdown. They got out of the, uh, the starting gates pretty quickly once we emerged uh, from that uh, lockdown. And the investors lost their uh, pessimism about price movement um, pretty quickly, but they were still maybe two to three months behind the uh, first home buyers there. And of course, once the investors really jumped in uh, boots and all, uh, FOMO, fear of missing out, uh, completely taking over. The sort of thing that you'll be seeing in, let's say, crypto markets or Tesla shares sometimes, or hey, maybe it's um, small uh, minerals company shares in Australia or whatever. People fearful of missing out. And we had that massive frenzy in New Zealand's housing market between basically August through to February. 
the monthly survey I've been doing since about April last year with the REINZ of real estate agents around New Zealand allows me to explicitly see on a monthly basis the change in FOMO, the change in pricing uh, pressure perceptions by the agents, changes in who they perceive has the greatest power, the, the vendor or the buyer, um, etc. And I can see, you know, uh, their perceptions, changes in them of uh, the presence of first home buyers, presence of investors, why the investors are, are buying, uh, what's concerning the buyers uh, generally, all that sort of thing um, out there. Now, of key significance here, of course, is that it wasn't just the mortgage rates going down. For the first time ever, when economists like myself have been talking about monetary policy easing, we've seen something different from the past. In the past, it's always been monetary policy is easing, mortgage rates are going down. Monetary policy is tightening, mortgage rates are going up, blah, blah, housing market, the economy. This time, first time ever, we're saying monetary policy is being eased, mortgage rates are going down, bank deposit rates are falling to the lowest level you've ever seen. Why would you leave your money sitting in the bank earning 0.8% uh, with inflation back then at 1.5% uh, earlier this year, uh, when uh, you will go backwards basically um, after tax. And so around the world, these low interest rates led to a flow of money going into the residential property market. Sydney prices are up about 30%. Uh, on a year ago, uh, for instance. So not just New Zealand. We were simply first out of the blocks in the housing market boom. And obviously with house prices rising strongly, everybody convinced there's a shortage in every part of the country. Every man and his dog has gone out to buy sections, um, uh, development companies uh, hoovering up land, um, et cetera. And so we've seen obviously a big uh, increase in residential um, construction. Now, a second big policy uh, explaining the bounce in the economy would be the government's wage subsidy schemes. Uh, employers in New Zealand went into the lockdown with the biggest problem for many of them being a shortage of labour. They didn't want to lay people off, but when you're facing some sort of apocalypse, you're naturally thinking we're going to have to lay off 20, 30, 50 percent of our staff. But the wage subsidy scheme meant businesses did not have to do that. They could hold on to their staff to see what would happen. The wage subsidy scheme was very effective policy. It bought time. And by the time we were approaching uh, decisions having to be made, the end of the first uh, wage uh, subsidy scheme there, the first tranche of it, businesses could see the economy wasn't bucketing away. The data were coming out showing growth. The stories were around of businesses already looking for new staff. And so that uh, aggressively kept the rise in the unemployment rate and very quickly led to some new jobs growth in the economy. So hence the unemployment rate only got to the 5.2% and of course now bucketing off fairly rapidly as well. Another insulating factor or helpful factor for the economy, uh, there's normally about nine to $10 billion we Kiwis would spend on overseas travel. We couldn't do it. We've diverted, I estimate, about half of that money towards domestic spending. I did a special survey a few months ago asking people, what did you do uh, with money you had allocated for travel overseas, but you, know, you didn't go overseas? What did you do with it? And almost exactly 50% of the money was spent on things you know, like your home renovations, um, cars, uh, recreational you know, uh, bikes, all these sort of things. The other half was either used to reduce um, one's mortgage, uh, put in a bank account, uh, went into managed funds, uh, shares, investment property, commercial property, etc. And so you know, maybe $5 billion extra stimulus to the economy. And of course, with ourselves having looked at our sorry seven, uh, four walls there for seven weeks, uh, a surge in activity, home renovations. And in particular, a lot of stuff that people were thinking about doing maybe next year, three, even five years down the track, people decided to bring that into the present. Uh, upgrading of one's house where you exist or moving to something um, better. Young people maybe who had been thinking about um, traveling for a few years and then buying a house, reversing the thing to do the purchase of the house or the construction, excuse me, of a new house first and then do some traveling um, a bit further on. So I'd put that in there also as another insulating factor. Also of importance for us as a uh, primary producing economy, about 32% of our exports go to China, including Hong Kong. 
the Chinese eradication strategy was quite successful back at the time. Their economy sort of opening up domestically, people earning money and getting out and about again. Uh, the growth in the Chinese economy has been very positive for our sales of food, fiber products across there. And so, yeah, China's performance through all of this has definitely been of benefit um, to the New Zealand uh, economy. And usually there's another one I whack in there. Nah, I've covered enough. Basically, a lot of extra factors came along. At one point, I made a list of 24 of these insulating and stimulatory factors. But we can look back and say, these seem to be the reasons why our economy has performed so well. And so we get to where we are now. And what I'm going to do now is do what we economists always do, have always done when we're looking at where our economy is going to go. Whether I'm talking to investors, you know, property buyers, businesses, advisors like yourself, um, whatever. We always concentrate on sources of demand. Will there be more customers coming along for the construction sector, um, for the farmers, for the retailers, the manufacturers? So that's the exercise I'm going to run through, even though these days that is less and less relevant as a determinant of how fast our economy will grow, what the degree of inflationary pressure will be, what the growth level of profitability will be for many businesses. But let's run through the exercise first of all, because that's all what we're, what we're used to. Will there be more people looking to buy our stuff? Well, internationally, we're still looking at about 4.5% growth in the world economy um, this year, and then slowing down, it's expected by the IMF to slightly below average paces of growth in the next three years um, or so. So it's not reasonable to be thinking that there's a whole massive new surge in demand coming along for New Zealand's products, but it is reasonable to think that the demand levels, the commodity prices we're seeing at the moment will probably continue maybe for the next couple of years in the context of economies opening up more, people looking to get out, eat out, etc., enjoy themselves. And that eating out, drinking out tends to be beneficial for New Zealand with the, the food products in particular um, that we produce. And of course, also with the uh, wood products, with the boom in house construction around the world, maybe not so much in China, maybe some of those logs will eventually go um, somewhere else uh, out there. But I can look at our current high level of commodity prices on average up to 24% from a year ago. So that's the ANZ's monthly uh, commodity price index. And the dairy prices, we're looking at uh, near record levels there for the uh, global tr dairy trade uh, main index and strong payout obviously coming forward from Fonterra, et cetera. From the primary sector, it's been an insulating factor for our economy, and I still see it as a positive go growth uh, contributing factor going forward in terms of, you know, the regions doing reasonably well, flowing back through to the cities from that world growth outlook being okay. The borders opening up again at some point, and so we will get some lift in tourism. I'm not as optimistic about the surge or lift in tourism being as strong as uh, maybe I was thinking previously, with China still uh, uh, pursuing an eradication uh, strategy. It doesn't look like they're going to be willing to open up their borders for an extended period of time. If you're going to China, you still need to go into isolation for at least two weeks. Beijing, I think, if you're going there, capital city, I think it's about three weeks or, or so. And for returning Chinese, you know, that's a big ask for them to uh, expect to do that. That we're probably not looking at that very large market um, coming back again until maybe it's 2023, uh, 2024. And uh, for the rest of the world, I certainly do think we'll see some visitors uh, coming in, um, but I think it's going to be maybe a little bit of a dense squib um, initially. What the heck, we'll start to get a few more students coming back, so these things at least move on to the net um, positive side. Um, business investment is going to be picking up. I don't think it's going to be any sort of a massive boom here uh, at all, but many businesses have got no choice. They can't find the labor that they want. They're going to have to invest in productivity enhancing, machinery, computer systems, buildings, or whatever. There is some business capital expenditure growth, which is going to be um, occurring. And of course, there's a lot of infrastructure work to be done all around the country at the local government level and uh, central government. There's quite good growth in some areas of commercial construction. So warehousing, logistics in particular, with you and I doing more shopping online and uh, businesses, of course, finding that just in time uh, inventory management is very dangerous in a world with uh, compromised supply chains. And so we're starting to see warehouses getting filled up with raw materials, 
work in progress, all that sort of thing. So around the world, growth and construction of warehouses, uh, uh, logistics facilities, fulfillment centers, I think Amazon calls them, um, is relatively strong, including here in New Zealand. And of course, residential construction, a lot of houses to be built uh, in New Zealand. Uh, we've got the biggest boom in house construction uh, since the early 1970s. And so, as I've said many times in the past, house building has a large multiplier impact through the economy. You build a house, it means extra business for the building materials, manufacturers, distributors, uh, the architectural services, consenting services, infrastructure needs to be upgrading. It has a big bang for the buck, basically. So I'd put that one out there as a growth stimulatory uh, factor as well. Household spending, certainly when Auckland gets freed up, I think there's catch up spending uh, generally uh, to be done uh, there. And in particular, uh, one of my surveys says to me that although we can see the low unemployment rate of 3.4%, I don't think as yet most people are willing to let themselves feel good job security. I think there's still an uncertainty, a hesitancy out there in a, in a, in a world still of lockdowns, of you know, traffic light system, et cetera, coming along. I think the benefit to our economy, to retailers of people feeling, I've got a job, I'm going to keep it. If they lay me off, I'm going to easily going to get another one. And having that feed through to willingness to purchase stuff, I actually think that has still yet to run through the economy over 2022 and 2023. So I think that'll be a factor supporting uh, private uh, consumption. Also, there's the fact that the value of the housing stock in New Zealand has increased about 400, 400 billion uh, from pre-COVID uh, levels. That, that's a big increase in people's uh, wealth. And that's where later on when I'm talking about interest rates, um, it's going to be interesting. Uh, my debt servicing goes up. Hey, who cares? My house uh, price for my investment's gone through the roof over the past year and a half. Uh, it's not going to have the same degree of uh, pullback on people's willingness to spend as uh, would have been the case in previous cycles. But I still think there's a good level of household spending uh, activity to come along. But there will be some pullbacks in some areas I'll talk about um, late, later on. Some specific sectors out there, there's, there's strong underlying growth, your biotech, uh, green energy, space industry, aged care uh, facilities, et cetera, uh, with the aging population, um, the healthcare sector, obviously growth there, uh, wine, a bit of a pushback at the moment with the volumes being down, but good prices being received overseas, et cetera. So horticulture, maybe more generally, I should say there, there seems to be some strong underlying growth um, in that uh, sector. And so that sort of sits on top of the normal macroeconomic things that economists like myself talk about. And also, let's just consider fiscal policy as well. Uh, what are the chances that a majority Labour government, which is having some issues, uh, I would suggest coming forward um, in, the, uh, in the polls there, is going to pursue a policy of fiscal austerity over the next two years heading into the uh, next general election, uh, I don't think the chances are particularly high. I still think the government generally is going to be uh, adding a little bit to growth um, in the economy. As we saw last weekend's uh, Labour Party conference, extra few hundred million over the next uh, few years going towards uh, some of the uh, families out there, uh, for instance. So I think maybe that's a bit of a supporting factor um, out there uh, as well. And so I, I can look at those things and lots of other sort of general macroeconomic aggregate demand driving stuff. And I look at it and I go, yeah, seems reasonable to expect our economy is going to achieve some good growth over the near future. Uh, that sounds like something that's going to be positive for business um, profitability, for uh, growth in uh, employment. Sounds like some pretty good stuff. But the thing is, the key point I've been making over the past few years, I did this from 2005 to 2007 and then started it up again just uh, a few years ago. We have become a capacity constrained our economy. Our ability to grow is less and less a function of the number of people queuing up to buy our products and more and more a function of deficiencies of resources, either the materials, the supply chains um, problems at the moment, or more especially the labor resource. And that's what I'm going to talk about now, because it's these sort of problems and their implications, which are really going to be a key determinant of differences in company profitability uh, going uh, forward, um, driving overall growth in the economy, um, etc. 
there, this is where big challenges lie. And there are, I think, some fairly major implications when it comes to uh, interest rates, debt service and costs, especially for the poor beggars who have not seen a proper monetary policy tightening cycle before. This is going to be a little bit of a wake up call uh, for some maybe highly geared people out there, not just maybe some of the younger home buyers, but of course, also some in the businesses uh, sector as well. So I'm going to have a run through a, a sort of a list of things here. I don't know if I'll cover uh, everything. Um, and if you've got some other suggestions for some of these underlying trend structural things, um, by all means, send them through. Let me start with the big one here, and that is a deficiency of labour. And let me approach this from the angle of some data which are included in the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research, NZIER, Quarterly Survey of Business Opinion, QSBO. The survey has been around since the late 1960s. And in the uh, 1970s, early part of the decade, they started asking you know, questions about what's the main reason you cannot increase your output? Now, for most quarters, companies are responding, main reason I can't increase my output is not enough customers. I mean, that's what we're used to you know, for a couple of centuries uh, here in New Zealand. On average, since the 1970s, a uh, gross 62% of businesses say can't increase output, not enough customers. The most recent survey, 25%. It's the lowest since about turning of 1973-74. You've got 28% of businesses saying main reason I can't increase output, not enough labour, cannot get the staff. A record net 71% of businesses say it is hard to get skilled labour. A near record 53% of businesses say can't even get unskilled labour out there. Businesses are finding that they cannot get the staff they want. And my strong warning for the past 12 to 15 months has been, if you think it's bad at the moment, you wait for the next 12, 24, 36, you know, 48 months or so. It's going to become even tougher. The availability of labour is going to become even worse for a variety of reasons. So in no particular order, uh, when the borders open up and people can travel sort of freely overseas, not have to worry about MIQ uh, coming back, whatever, there's two years worth of uh, OE for young people to be caught up on. There's two years worth of professional sector OE, you know, doing the nine month contract as an accountant across in London. This is leading to an outflow of these professionals from Australia going across to, to the UK. The same thing is going to happen in New Zealand uh, as well. So there's those factors uh, are there. Also, there's just simply the fact that when the labour market booms in Australia, we Kiwis go across. It's what we've done generation after generation. There are massive shortages of people across um, in Australia. You learn higher wages, you get a lower cost of living, you get a lower house price on average um, as well. And so I think when the borders open up, we're going to get not just your OE catch up people disappearing uh, across the ditch there. I think just a lot of people generally, sort of young people, late teenagers, people in their 20s, early 30s, I think we're going to see quite an outflow um, across to Australia. A brain drain sort of commentary is going to be starting up um, a bit more than has been the case. Uh, it's going to happen over the coming year. Also, of course, and making things worse, a lot of people have made a lot of money from their investments, uh, whether it's shares, maybe crypto, whether it's houses over the past wee while, including people approaching retirement. A lot of people are going to retire early. Uh, why bother earning uh, extra when I've got two investment properties? They've each gone up 35% from you know, 18 months ago. I've got an extra sort of $700,000 sitting in there in my net wealth that I never thought I was going to have. A lot of people are going to take the opportunity to retire early. They already are around the world. Um, and some just simply maybe embracing a little bit more of lifestyle. We've all had to, you know, been doing some serious thinking about ourselves over the past 18 months. That also is going to dry things up. The government has already been stating well over 12 months now when the borders open up, they will not be letting in as many uh, migrant workers as was the case previously. They've shown a, a delayed response on the uh, horticultural uh, primary sector workers, etc. But overall, they're going to be knocking back um, on the numbers. And while in New Zealand, we like to think everybody is going to be knocking on our doors wanting to come in here, what they're already finding in Australia is a reluctance actually of people in the UK, even backpackers to go down to Australia. They're just worried about being isolated, locked down, not being able to get back home again in a reasonable period of time. And we're even further flung um, than Australia. So, you know, I think generally we're going to be looking at 
net migration losses for New Zealand starting at some point next year. It means anyway, the labor market is going to remain very, very tight. And you take that along with supply chain problems continuing through all of 2022 into 23. China is where so many things are made. They keep going into massive lockdowns at the drop of a hat as they pursue the eradication strategy. It leads to the ports closing. It leads to shipping firms not operating, uh, trucking firms. It leads to factories um, closing down. And so these problems that you're seeing out there at the moment, everything I'm reading from overseas suggests that this continues right through 2022 into uh, 2023. And so businesses are facing these resource shortage problems. And a key point I've been making for some time now, even before COVID, was that if you run your business in the old way, you're going to run into problems. And the old way was, I'll secure lots and lots of customers, advertise and get the orders. Then I will secure the resources. Then I will find new premises, new supply chains, uh, put an order for more materials. I'll find the people. I'll get the finance. Well, if you do things that way around, you're going to commit to orders you're not going to be able to meet. You'll try and meet them by hiring dope smoking, pee taker, whatever sort of people out there. The quality of the work is going to suffer. If you're the business owner, you're going to be working at the weekends. Your family life's going to get shattered, et cetera. And profitability uh, is going to disappear as you're very busy. You're not keeping a, a close eye enough on the uh, finances, et cetera. And think about the supply chain problems as well. Um, you've actually got some materials in. You've done some part of the job. Um, but you can't invoice for the full job, maybe until the thing is finished. There are these short-term financing problems that are really starting to appear out there, catching a lot of companies out. And the way forward for businesses these days has to be, what resources can I secure, keep now, train up, retain for the next five years? What level of output and output growth will that allow me to achieve over the next few years? And for some businesses, the answer already is, I cannot even sustain my current level of output. I should be cutting output, putting prices up as a possibility. And for businesses generally, one way to assess them uh, is to look at what is their ability to figure out who are my highest paying or highest yielding customers, kicking out the lowest yielding ones. Businesses need to focus on their highest yielding products, get rid of the crap. Best uh, yielding locations of production, uh, of distribution, all of these sort of things businesses have to go through. And managing your business is going to become a lot harder than it's been in the past. That's a big point of delineation for businesses generally in New Zealand because uh, our management skills are not as good as it seems to be the case overseas, according to a lot of the research I was spending a lot of time looking at about 10 um, or 12 years ago. So that labour market one, it's bad at the moment. It will get worse. It will cause a big weeding out through a lot of sectors in the New Zealand economy. And the best businesses will be ones that have good skills and resource management not traditional you know, resource management wetland thing, but acquiring and keeping people, good HR policies, et cetera. And it's gonna be less and less on those who have got the greatest branding and that sort of thing. Um, where else should we have a good look at? Um, another thing to think about going forward, some sectors have surprised massively on the upside over the past uh, 15 months. Uh, none of us expected that uh, in a global pandemic and with a recession, you and I will, buy more spas, gazebos, electric bikes, uh, Audis, will decide to replace the roofs, uh, put an extension on the house. This is not what normally happens when you know, uh, you're facing a recession. We have binged on many of these things and there's gonna be a payback at some point. I only need a new spa every four decades. I only need to do the home renovations every you know, two or three decades, something like that. And so to the extent some sectors, furniture, whatever, have surprisingly boomed, there's going to be a decline somewhere down the track. And I recall back in February this year, Jerry Harvey across in Australia, they're saying they know that their sales of furniture, which have absolutely boomed, cannot remain at that level. There will be a pulling back at some stage. We don't seem to be at that stage as yet. And some of the stuff maybe that you and I were going to buy, uh, it's on order. We have to wait for it to be made in China and then shipped across to New Zealand. But maybe further out in 2022, there will be sectors which will be surprised with uh, negativity on their sales and that will catch some operators out as the unsustainable binge fades away, especially in sectors where things we were going to do in four years, we've brought that stuff into the present 
well, that, that all disappears. It's basically gone for the next wee while. So um, just keep an eye on, on that one. Another thing I'm interested in, starting to fall more into your own space there, would be portfolio uh, shifts. You might have noticed I've started up a new monthly survey, a portfolio investment survey, and that was partly motivated uh, by the outcome of the special survey I referred to earlier on about what did you do with money you did not spend traveling. About half of it went into savings and all these other different ranges of investments you're living, uh, dealing with. My very first indicator that there was something happening of interest in the investment space uh, for this whole pandemic uh, thing, came in the first version of my monthly spending plans survey I did in, I think it was April of last year. I asked people, you're going to spend more or less in the next three to six months? What will you spend more or less on? And so I just listed, will you spend more or less on motor vehicles, eating out? You know, I did a lovely little list there. And thank goodness I left this category of other for the first survey back in April last year, three and a half thousand people replied. So I didn't look at the other category right until the end. And I'd written up the survey results and I thought, I guess I'd better have a look at other before I go and send this stuff out. And so I started scrolling through all the responses that people have put in there and was absolutely astounded at the number of people who were writing uh, in terms of what else will I spend on? A house to live in, an investment property and shares, a few cryptos in there um, as well. That said to me that people were looking to be very active on the investment space. And the new uh, monthly survey I've uh, had running now for a couple of years, I'm looking to identify the changes at the margin I expect now to be happening as people re-weight a little bit away from uh, the, the focus on residential uh, property towards other areas. And if I have a look at the most recent survey I sent out uh, a week and a half or so ago, um, I'm asking people, uh, for instance, a whole range of question. Uh, what will you look to buy more of in the next 12 months? Assets, a whole range, about a dozen of them. And what will you look to sell? And so I can look at buy versus sell. I can net get a net purchase uh, number out of that. And so, for instance, I had, I think, a gross uh, 30, sorry, 11% of people saying, I'm going to buy more residential property. But I had a gross 30% saying, I'm going to sell residential property. So a net 19 19% of the 1800 respondents said, I'm going to sell residential property. In contrast, when I add up all the people who said they would buy shares, ETFs, or managed funds, mainly equities, you'd know, versus those selling, a net 19 19% saying they're going to buy essentially equities um, by and large. Um, I've also got, uh, I think it was about a net 4% of people saying they're looking to buy commercial property and, uh, and cryptos. And I can also break the results down by four age groups. And the crypto one is fascinating because I've got something like a gross 13% of people 30 and below saying, I'm going to buy cryptos. And a gross 18, 1.8% of them saying, I'm going to sell cryptos. Young people aren't buying cryptos as a long-term hold. It's a game. It's a form of entertainment. And so when I do sort of the age distribution of the cryptos, it's sort of declining over time as you go from the youngest age group to the oldest. It's the opposite profile of intentions to buy commercial property. The older that you are, the more inclined you are to think I'm going to buy commercial property, whereas that's not so much a thing for you know the younger generation. So have a look at that uh, portfolio survey, of, uh, investment survey. It sits on the uh, publications page of uh, my website, and uh, I'm, I'm looking to develop that a little bit over, over time. Another thing I wanted to uh, put out there as, as a point to think about going forward, uh, and I'm about to stop in a couple of minutes, uh, I've already mentioned it a little bit, Household lending has boomed, 10.8% uh, growth in household debt over the past year. Business debt has only grown about 2.7% in the past year. There's a view that well, as household lending growth goes down, business lending growth goes up. In some ways, we're late in the cycle. All those booming sectors, et cetera, the bankers are getting weary. They uh, will not only be tightening up their criteria for lending for home purchases, et cetera, but I would suggest maybe on the business side as well. They can see the stresses and strains appearing in the business sector generally. I do not expect that banks are going to be stepping forward and saying, we're creating a big fund to help finance you know, the business sector out there. They're going to be going through accounts uh, you know, with a bit of a fine tooth comb as all these stresses and strains come along. And let me just finish up by noting uh, with interest rates uh, going up, 
Well, of course, this has been sort of one of my favorite topics over the past uh, 15 months or so. I so often and so heavily said in response to my written question in my publication, if I were a borrower, what would I do? I repeatedly said I would fix for five years at 2.99%. I would not take the one year candy at 2.19% because eventually there's going to be an interest rate catch up. Our Reserve Bank is massively behind the curve in tightening monetary policy. There's going to be a catch up at some point. They've only increased the cash rate 0.25% and yet already fixed mortgage rates are up from where they were five months ago between 1.3% and 1.7%. I expect at least the same magnitude of those increases within the next uh, 12 to uh, 15 uh, months. And it is going to be a bit of a shock for some borrowers out there, but it's going to take a while for the shock to be to be felt. I've got a sort of a whole list of reasons why, as the Reserve Bank raises interest rates, most people are going to go, meh, meh. I'm not going to, uh, they're not going to be all worried. When the Reserve Bank raises interest rates, what they want is you and I as householders to pull back on our spending. For us to go, I'm worried about the future, I won't buy a new car or a couch or all these sort of things. I think it's going to take a while before they get that response. So you really need to be looking for those businesses that are exposed to uh, rapid repricing, you know, short-term debt with high debt levels. And there's going to be a lot of them out there because many have ridden a boom, an optimistic boom in some sectors over the past you know, year and a half, if not you know five years. There's going to be a bit of a reality check out there. So look, I'll stop at that point with a bit of a warning on the interest rates. Uh, there are big surprises coming down the track and we'll open the whole thing up there, uh, Ben, and just see how we go in the uh, next wee while. Yeah, cool. Cool. Thank you very much for that. I've got some questions through and what I might try to do is, is lump a couple of them together because there, there's a bit of um, you know, a few themes coming through in the, the questions. So sticking to the, the interest rate piece, um, I mean, the, the key thing really here is interest rates dropped. So we're really only talking back to going back to pre-pandemic levels. Yeah. Um, so then at which pain point do you see nationally that we're going to get to that as a country, we can sustain it without potentially having the bottom fall through over and above that? Yeah. The Reserve Bank had to create a recession in 2008 in order to get inflation under control. People talk about, oh, house prices fell 11% during the GFC. No, they didn't. House prices fell 9% in the first three quarters of 2008 after the Reserve Bank had pushed floating mortgage rates to 10.6%. The GFC only accounted from the collapse of Lehman's for another 2% fall in prices. The Reserve Bank had already had to be bastards to get things under control. They raised interest rates just 3.25% um, over something like about a three and a half year period. I was highly critical at the time saying they need to move, needed to go faster, faster, faster. Uh, eventually, a couple of years later, they said, yeah, we should have gone faster. My concern, and this isn't my view at the moment, but this question is going to be put out there. Is the Reserve Bank going to have to create a recession to get inflation under control? The odds will increase on that as each quarter goes by, and most of us go, what do I care if interest rates went up? My investments just went up by 35% over the past uh, year and a half. Um, I've got a job. I'm going to get a decent wage increase. Uh, if they lay me off, the bastards, I can easily get another job, you know, somewhere else. There's a lot to push back against uh, for the Reserve Bank out there. And I'll probably do an article on this listing all these factors. And I think I, I wrote them down here. Have a look at this one. People say, oh, households are so highly indebted now that a 1% increase in interest rates will hit them far, far more than before. Uh, ahead of the GFC, the ratio of Household debt to income was 157%. We're only at 169 now. That's not much of an increase. Oh, uh, but the interest rates, you know, uh, this sort of thing, what's the impact going to be there? Uh, oh, did I write this one down? Um, the debt servicing ratio, so interest payments versus the income of the household sector, at the moment, it's a record low of 5.3%. That ratio was 10% interest payments versus household disposable income at the start of the tightening cycle last time at the start of 2004 there is massive scope for people to be able to afford these higher interest rates and especially as the banks have been doing uh they lend to me at two and a half but they work out my ability to pay a mortgage at six percent there's a big buffer sitting in there so this is why i think it was last week my lead article was the reserve bank has actually created a problem they wanted household government business balance sheets to be so strong that when a shock comes along, people go, I can handle this. 
my debt's okay, my cash flow management is good. And the Reserve Bank have very successfully done that. But the problem is, they are the shock. They are the shock coming along. They need to raise interest rates to shock us and make us go, oh, now I'm worried and pull back. But they've done such a good job with restricting debt growth and you know using the LVRs, et cetera. The upside on these interest rates, I would suggest, is a hell of a lot more than people are thinking. I don't think we go back to you know 9.5%, 9.9%, uh, uh, one to three year fixed interest rates or something like that. But I can easily see the one year rate 5.5% and uh, uh, more, and it is gonna start to catch some people out further out. So it's not my view that they will have to create a recession to get inflation under control, but with inflation at 4.9%, a record net 66% of businesses in the ANZ's monthly survey saying, I'm going to increase my selling prices. A record uh, net 83% of households in the Reserve Bank's survey of household expectations saying they expect the rate of inflation is going to go up. They are so far behind the curve here. It's uh, I've got to restrain myself from using words like negligent, uh, irresponsible in the commentaries uh, that I'm writing about the poor old RV at the moment. They, uh, they have lost the plot and there's going to be a payback. So maybe in 18 months time, this will be interesting. So, so on that note then, there's, particularly in the finance world, it's, it's a lot about this transitory inflation and whether it's permanent or not. Where do you sit on the ledger? What, what sort of, I mean, obviously your sparkles and, and furniture, you've got the spike in, but what about that more sort of sustainable core um, inflation? Yeah, two sort of elements here, um, the transitory, the temporary, eventually the surge in shipping costs will fade, the uh, bidding up of materials prices, what, four by twos or whatever the heck it is, it will fade, but the view was initially the fading will start next year, now the view seems to be calm, maybe that's not going to happen until 2023, because of the, it's going to take, take so long for the shipping lines to go back to old routines, the empty containers to get to where they should be in China, etc., so uh, the central bank leaders overseas have in recent weeks been saying it looks like the transitory is going to last a bit longer than we were thinking. So that's the first point to note here. And that's important because it leads to our expectations of inflation going up. And people are increasingly talking about there is a growing risk that inflation expectations become unanchored. So in other words, we start thinking, they're not going to be able to, inflation's not going to be 2% in the near future. It's going to be 3% or more. Articles will start to be written. The Reserve Bank is going to uh, get an alteration in its inflation target from 1% to 3% to something higher. I've only seen one article like that so far. Easy to push back against that. But this will increase in frequency going out. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. I've already mentioned that between 2013 and 19, average inflation in New Zealand uh, was about 1.2% or so. The problem was deflation. Now, I spoke repeatedly about what, why is it that post GFC worldwide, the inflation never appeared that any single one of us expected from 2010. It's because, in my opinion, if you and I see the price of something we buy going up, we go online and we do find something cheaper. We'll go and buy it. We'll wait six weeks for it to be delivered out of Kazakhstan or whatever. So businesses have lost pricing power because I have so much power now as a consumer. Not now. If they put the price up on me for whatever reason, I go online, I find the cheaper alternative. The shipping costs are four to five times what they were previously. And it's not a six day or six week delay. It's six months before maybe the table can be shipped out of Norway or Kazakhstan or something like that. So now I cannot undercut businesses as was the case previously. Businesses have got repricing power back at the same time as we have a four decade high in the strength of the bargaining position of labor around the world. People have an ability to get higher income now that they've never had before for most of them in their working lives. Now, overseas, this maybe will more readily manifest itself with high wage demands. In New Zealand, that'll take a while to come through. And this is gonna be very interesting. Um, there's a survey I did some commentary on a few weeks ago for Persol Cali. They're, they're going to do all the recruitment for next year or the 2023 census. And the survey they had was, uh, let's say, uh, New Zealand employers, hirers, and the New Zealand staff and candidates. And they asked the employers, what do you think is important to the candidates? And so, you know, well-being, uh, health and safety, uh, flexible work practices, salary growth, all that sort of thing. Now, they asked the same thing of the candidates, of the staff. 
Uh, they were pretty much the same on every one, except for one. Only 20% of the employers said, oh, we think the candidates value salary growth. 44% of the candidates said, I value salary growth. We Kiwis do not let it be known to our potential employers that we're in it for the money. Same survey in Australia, only 31% of the candidates value the salary growth is important. We're money hungry. The only way we're going to get it is basically go to Australia. So hence my labor market comment and employers are going to be surprised by they gave a 5% wage increase and the staff is still disappearing. That's going to be a key uh, point of delineation of well-managed HR sort of firms versus those that are not. I put all these different elements together, uh, lost regaining of business pricing power, wage pricing power coming back again, transitory, not being transitory, and it leads to a risk that inflation starts to consolidate at a high level. And at some point, the Reserve Bank will turn. At some point, they will revert to what their real job is, keeping inflation an anchored at 2%, because they know if they lose control of that, it leads to major problems down the track and they will possibly crunch the economy. And I think the supply chain problems and some of these wage price spiral dynamics starting to come in play will increase the chances that they really have to be absolute bastards. 2023, best guess. So just uh, dropping in a question there then. So the similarities between the immediate future and the inflationary times of the 80s, 70s and 80s, different world, different metrics in place, just different tools? Yeah, uh, difference, not the 70s. We don't have the unionization, clone, clone, cozy relationships, all that sort of thing um, out there. Um, so that, that is a different dynamic. It's not the inflation's already high fighting of the 1980s. Uh, was that Paul Volcker in the United States and here in New Zealand, whichever Reserve Bank governor was there at the, at the time. It's not that. It's more pre-GFC. Starting from a low level, so not starting with mortgage rates at, uh, uh, well, three three percent or whatever higher than they are at the moment but i think it is going to be that sort of a fight and the main question in my mind is will it take the reserve bank uh 2004 five six three and a half years to really start kicking or will they do it sooner it took almost four years of tightening to eventually get the restraint they wanted last time around i i don't think it'll take them four years uh this time it's going to be something that happens more quickly but i think it's maybe the latter part of 2022 that they start to put the boot boot in and they will get inflation back under control it's simply a matter of how much how, how big a bastard you know do they need to be down the track wow. so then that being the case what's the risk of businesses here that that do jump in and give their staff decent wage increase but then you get that wage, uh, so your inflation under control, and they jump the gun to the point that it's almost, you, you give it away too soon. Are you going to see a potential uh, imbalance here in terms of catching up the imbalance of the, uh, the wage, uh, yep. to low wages across the country? It's a timing issue, I guess, in that if you don't give the wage increase, your staff are going to go, basically. These people are going to disappear. Um, and they're not even going to give many bosses the opportunity to pay an extra 10 or 15%. Psychologically, it's easier for me to go to Australia and call the boss back and say, I had to leave. It's going to be psychologically easier for the boss probably as well, because in New Zealand, if you go to the boss, say, give me 15%, they're going to think you're well up yourself and you can't be up yourself in New Zealand. And so my view is businesses will have to pay up uh, greater flexibility, recognition of staff. Uh, on my publications page, there is a survey results handling how to handle staff shortages. Um, from those who have been through this sort of thing before that might provide some useful guidance for some employers um, uh, out, out, out there. Okay. So I've got a final few questions coming through. A bit of a change here. It was more about New Zealand agri, uh, our meat economy, so to speak, and um, carbon. What are you seeing particularly in, in New Zealand given our, our carbon emissions and what impact that will have on our economy? Yeah, got to head, get ahead of the curve. We're well behind the curve, I think, on addressing the issues in the agricultural sector. We just saw yesterday Scott Morrison announce a $1 billion Aussie dollar fund uh, to assist uh, businesses starting up looking at uh, methane reduction uh, techniques. Maybe it's the seaweed thing or, or whatever. Um, in New Zealand, we still seem to be relatively behind the play there. We think the primary production sector is so massively important, which it is, that we can't put this impost upon them of having to very quickly reduce their methane methane reductions, you know, nitrous oxide, or sorry, whatever these are, nitrate, um, et cetera. But the risk is that we'll move so slowly, we will face active tariff barriers from the rest of the world. 
this thing is accelerating and uh, I still think there's a bit of a catch up realization to cut through there. So yeah, I think there are some pressures coming along for our primary sector and they're gonna have to, the government I think is gonna have to move more rapidly than they have with the very slow movement of the farmers into the emissions trading scheme, for instance. I think that's just gonna have to be accelerated uh, out there. And businesses generally, what have we got? Tower today saying they're introducing a differential uh, premium pricing for flood prone properties. Uh, for instance, so more of more of that is going to be flowing through. Of course, as yet, no one's given a damn when it comes to purchasing a holiday home, what the flood risk is from a river or a seaside or whatever. That's that's astounding. But at some point, those chickens uh, do come home to roost. What was the first part of that question? I was just going to say something on it. it was... uh, the meat production. Um... Yeah, just on the meat production. I know it's easy to say, oh, you poor meat producers, you're going to get wiped out by meat alternatives. Yeah, I used to think that, but now I'm thinking... I'm either going to eat meat or I'm going to eat veggies. Why the hell would I get a fake chicken burger? If I'm going to eat chook, I'll eat the chook. And uh, I've decided the fake meats don't interest me personally. So that's just my view as a, as a consumer. I'm not going to buy a fake meat burger patty or that sort of thing. I'll just get a veggie patty. If I want the taste of chook, I'll buy chook. So that's, just, that's all I was going to say. Makes sense. Well, I think from there, we're pretty much out of, out of questions and it's, it's almost 12 o'clock. So I think that's probably good timing. Um, so I guess as per usual, thank you very much for, for, for coming along, talking to, to our clients and guests today. And, and thank you very much to all the, um, the guests that have popped on to have a listen. Uh, I just did want to do one more plug of your website. It was tonyalexander.nz, I believe. Yeah, .nz. Uh, you can just go in there, sign up for the Tony's View. I have a excuse me, a separate publication there, the TView Premium uh, for 110 bucks a year. Uh, be careful before you sign up to that one. Everything in the head uh, just gets vomited on the pages, basically. Last week was, was 25 pages. This maybe is going to be 17 or 18 or, or so. So there's a lot more detailed information. But you keep an eye on the uh, portfolio investment survey, how that one might develop a little bit over time, because uh, I can start to craft some, some interesting stories. I've tended to stay away from the personal investment, portfolio investment side. And I'm not going to be jumping in there like a merry home or anything like that. Um, but I'm hoping to at least provide some information for people to think about. That, that's my aim there. That's all. No, I will be keen to keep an eye on that, have a bit of look. But from myself, Roger, uh, Grant and Jack, again, thank you very much for, for coming to speak. And, and to everyone who's joined us, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll throw a copy online if anyone wants to go and have a listen to some parts they may have missed. And uh, yeah, if they've got any questions, fire them through to me uh, and maybe in the next sort of day or so we might be able to use you for another few minutes for a few more questions uh in writing but we'll see what happens but yeah, other than no that again thank you very much and uh yeah i guess uh happy happy shopping here in Auckland. yeah yeah all the best people up in Auckland there enjoy thank cheers you. cheers bye-bye